Elliot Forster is the Chief Executive Officer of F-Star Therapeutics, a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company dedicated to developing next-generation immunotherapies to transform the lives of patients with cancer. To date, the company has built a comprehensive IP estate with over 200 issued patents and more than 60 pending applications, many of which have blockbuster potential. In this conversation, we discuss Elliot's career as a corporate executive in Big Pharma, as well as his transition to and leadership experience in venture and growth stage biotech. Before coming to F-Star in 2018, he served as chief executive officer of Immunicore, and prior to that, he held executive positions at Creobilis Therapeutics, Solace Pharmaceuticals, and Pfizer. We also explore the broader biotech industry in the context of private company investing, as well as the specifics of F-STAR's drug development programs. We hope you enjoy the show. So Elliot, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. As mentioned, I think what would be great for our audience is if we could hear a little bit of background on yourself as well as F-Star Therapeutics. We first got to know you via the award you won recently for Top 25 biotech CEOs, which was awarded by the Healthcare Technology Report. And so maybe, yeah, we could kick off with a little bit of background. I've got a a fairly dull background, actually. So I spent my entire career, the past 30 years, in biotech and pharma. The first half of that in big pharma at GSK and Pfizer. Then for the past 15 years or so, I've been running biotechs. So I'm kind of serial CEO, I guess, is probably the best way to describe it. I'm a neurophysiologist by training and MBA qualified, which mainly just leaves me confused. F-Star itself is a clinical stage biotech, and we have a technology which we've been developing for the past decade, which enables us to tackle two cancer targets, so two things that we think will control cancer at the same time. And we do this in a particular way, like two pairs of hands grabbing two cells at the same time. And the company is based in uh, Cambridge in the UK and Cambridge in Massachusetts, so Cambridge Squared, as it were. One thing I always like to ask when folks have a background such as yours is, presumably you had some fantastic training working with some of the larger biotech and pharma companies. What was it, do you think, that enabled you to make that jump into kind of the more fragmented biotech world and to kind of take a leadership position of a smaller company? Part of my motivation was to see if the things I'd learned in big pharma were applicable in a different space. And to some extent, it was a a test of myself and a test of those experiences I brought to bear. I always like to joke that um, when I left big pharma, I had three officers, uh, two admins and access to the company helicopter. And I ended up literally the next morning with nothing. I was sitting on my kitchen table with $20 million in investment, but kind of staring into space and wondering what to do next. And I think my advice to people who want to move is that you've got to maintain a humility of of what you've actually experienced and how much of it can be applied. And often it's less than you might imagine. But the other is have a learning attitude. And when I first started in biotech, I used to joke that I was learning 100 new things every hour. And over the years, that's declined to 10 new things every hour. And I think as long as you continue to work like that and think like that, then things should be okay. The other secret, and this is not just true of biotech, it's also true of all walks of life, but is to get around you people who are more competent than you, but also people who are skilled and you trust and will deliver. And I've always been very lucky to find myself in that position. Obviously, when you're in The larger corporate environment, you stay for a while, you can stay up to a decade or longer. And subsequently, you've gone on to a few to several organizations. What prompt the transitions from one organization to the next? The fact is that biotechs are fragile, but it's not always been the case. And I've come through cycles, both in pharma, but in particular in biotech, where there's been no capital available. And sometimes capital can dry up. Capital will generally always find its way to technology and to people. And what happens in biotechs is that technologies fail. If you're doing your job properly in biotech, you should really only be carrying one major risk in the organization. And that risk is the one of does the drug work or doesn't it work? And if you can control everything else and test that, 
then occasionally the drug works, but mainly actually the drugs don't work. And of course, the true hero stories that should be told are about the thousands and thousands of people who work in dozens, if not hundreds of companies where they've done everything right, tested the hypothesis and it fails, but learn so much during that process. And of course, the ones we hear about are are the success stories. So indeed, my first two companies were manifestations of that. The first is we were testing in an area which was really complicated, which is in long-term pain, which is still an area for which collectively we haven't really solved. And we tested a hypothesis in the clinic in patients and we didn't get the effect. And as a result, that was the end of that company. And we all left and went on to different things. And the second company was bought. The third company I was in for a very specific task, uh, which I did, and here I am at at number four. We have a fairly broad audience here of folks in different backgrounds, some in biotech, but many also in traditional industries or other technology sectors such as software. So maybe just a little bit of further explanation on, are there situations where you're investing in, will this drug work or not, in very high failure rate? versus later stage where you already have some good evidence and you know there's going to be a successful path forward. And then we can parlay that into where does FSTAR sit now? There is a inverse relationship between the amount of capital needed and the amount of risk you have. So right at the very beginning, so a professor or someone coming out of a big company have got an idea and you need a small amount of money relatively, hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe one or two millions to begin to test that idea. And But of course, it's extremely high risk. There's no evidence, very little um, data to support whether the hypothesis will play out in terms of controlling the disease, treating the syndrome and so on. As one goes further on, you get more data and that risk begins to dissipate and narrow, in fact. And so as you get much further on into the clinic, You've got through many of those risks. You've been able to make prototype drug. You've probably tested it in uh, regulatory studies, which are not in humans, and then move into humans. And to do that, you've got to go through some regulatory hurdles. You have your data looked at by regulators across the world. But then, of course, you move into patients, and things start to get more expensive, and you move out of the single-digit millions into the double-digit millions. And you then go through tests. And so the first experiments in patients are usually in small studies, often very dispersed groups of patients or very focused groups of patients, depends on which therapeutic area one is working in. And then if it works there and it's safe, of course, the prototype can then move into later stage. In the later stage of development, just before you get to commercialization, you're then in the hundreds of millions of dollars, though the risk is dissipated. And I always make a joke about, but I say biotech does indeed have a P and L, and the P is for promise and loss. And biotech is really all about promise and loss. And it's the promise of things that might come while spending money. And of course, the outcome for a potential medicine that's gone from all the way at the beginning to all the way to the end is enormous. It will have survived and succeeded because it shows and makes a difference for patients. So that's enormous in its own right. And of course, drugs that are truly transformational for patients will also be profitable. They tend to go hand in glove, not every time, but they tend to go hand in glove. And so that's why the investment plays into that. At each stage, there are different sorts of investors, there are different sorts of entrepreneurs. And indeed, if you follow the life of a company, we all know the story of Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, you know, the founders, and they went through their tribulations and trials, but ended up you know, running the company at the end while things were being marketed. But that's probably possible in tech. In biotech, it is very, very unusual for a founder to have and be able to develop the skills that are then necessary to go through that regulatory stage, through that full development stage and then into the commercial stage, you tend to have a series of uh, senior teams with different skill sets in order to do that. And in a sense, that's how I fill my role. I sit in organizations when they're coming out of the laboratory and into the hospital, and that requires uh, internationalization. It requires going from single-digit investment to double-digit investment in millions uh, and different and different skill sets as well. Just to answer the final part of the question, that brings us to FSTAR. So FSTAR has four programs, believe it or not, in the clinic for a small organization. So we've already 
checked off a lot of that risk space that I was talking about earlier. And we've now moved into the tens of millions of expenditure. We're on NASDAQ, so that capital for the right investors with us becomes available uh, and is available. And we can test each of those hypotheses in different patient groups for each of those clinical drugs. And of course, one of the benefits of having more than one drug in the clinic is you also have, I guess you'd use an expression, more shots on goal. Be successful in that setting as well. And, and lots of biotechs try and develop a small handful of, of clinical drugs in order that they can have that opportunity. So with these four programs, is the idea that one or more will then go on to prove successful? And do they potentially sell off the asset or do you commercialize it yourself and then expand geographically the sales effort? So the way in which we've approached cancer at F-Star is we've looked at patients who really have few other options. Over the last 15 years or so, there's been a revolution in the treatment of cancer and there's been an emergence of treatments that manipulate our own immune system. So we use our own immune system to fight the cancer that we have. And there are drugs called checkpoint inhibitors that become really central in that. And they're absolutely transformational, but they're only transformational for about a third of patients. So it means that two thirds of patients are really not getting the benefit of this revolution in cancer treatment that has occurred. So F-Star, we focused our attention into that kind of forgotten two thirds Uh, rather than the third who are doing well. And so we're able then to go into patient groups who need treatments because there's nothing else available to them. And as a consequence, it would be possible for us to quickly get a license for that drug and sell it more widely, assuming that it or one of them uh, will work from these four that we have in play. Beyond that, of course, I think from a geographic perspective, we would focus in the US and in Europe, and certainly we'd look for partnerships Beyond that, even the most ambitious biotech CEO wouldn't necessarily say that you know his or her company can expand quickly into uh, Southeast Asia or uh, other parts of the world quickly. And so for us, we focus our clinical trials are running in the US and they're running in Europe, and we would focus our attention in there. So we may look for partnerships in that regard. The other thing that's a reality of biotech, and it's in part why so much investment goes in, is there are big fish and there are little fish. And the little fish tend to have the new and attractive drugs. And the big ones, like the company I came from, Pfizer, will go around and swallow the little ones in order to get that new piece of innovation for treatment. So one of the things that does happen is once some of these drugs, which are rare, get into that late stage, they often get swallowed up by the big fish. And there are lots of examples of that. And of course, the numbers more recently, particularly for potential drugs that are in late stage clinical development, get higher and higher, certainly multiple billions of return. From a Mac perspective, when we think about the number of biotech companies out there, it could be, I guess, like as it is in other industries, a pyramid shape where you get fewer very large biotech companies at the top. And then this fragmentation as you go down the pyramid and could be that there's portfolios of IP being developed all up and down that pyramid. And one biotech company in particular could have like a great portfolio for programs and that IP is going to be extremely valuable. So you can be picked up by one of the larger pharma companies. And so do you stop at the point of actually commercializing and going through the exercise of pricing the drug? At what point do you say, like, that's not for us or we'd rather sell than partner to kind of have to manage through the full commercialization part? Certainly for F-Star, we would keep both of those options open. I mean, I can imagine, you know, we've seen benefits in very rare diseases. So we've seen in oncology terms something which is very uncommon, which is a type of thyroid cancer. And we've Mm -hmm. got very long lasting uh, survival in that particular case. But that's a very, very rare disease, fortunately. But you could quite easily take a disease like that with one of our drugs and take that to market ourselves and commercialize it because it's a very specialist sales method. You go to specialists who in turn treat patients in a very limited number of clinics. So at that end, that would be what we would aim to do. On the other hand, you know, the most common cancer type is a kind of lung cancer. And there are unfortunately tens of thousands of patients who don't get this long-term benefit from, from checkpoint inhibitors. And that would really require a huge sales force and infrastructure. And certainly if we have benefit there, we would probably look to partner with one of the bigger fish, one of the big pharma players. 
I'd like to make a point, if you don't mind, one of the things that's really changed dramatically, and it's a very positive thing over the three decades that I've been in the business, is it used to be there were a lot of very large players and then a lot of tiny weeny players and very little in between. But what we've seen is the emergence of companies like Biogen, Regeneron, and so on, who've grown from tiny and up. And then what's in the middle today, which is fantastic, are a lot of intermediate sized players who have maybe one or two drugs in the market, one or two drugs in their portfolio. And that continuum of size and scale and investment is really, really important for our industry because it means that there is a flow of ideas, there are a flow of potential new drugs, there's a flow of capital, and there's also, interestingly, a flow of people because not everyone wants to be in what's effectively an insecure five-person biotech, and also not everyone wants to be in 125,000 company either and something in between and have their skills. And I have to say the way in which capital has flown through, particularly out of the US, which is the most sophisticated thinkers in terms of healthcare investment, the way in which that's evolved and caused the evolution of of the scale of companies, I think is absolutely terrific and stands patient ideas and of course, the economy that surrounds all of that in very good stead for the future. It was a real weakness 20 years ago. We're coming up on time here. If I may just ask, I typically like to ask a couple questions at the at the very end. One is, can you talk about a challenging situation you faced along the way and how you were able to overcome that challenging situation? I have a couple of particularly vivid memories. In the second company I was in, we were waiting for data to read out. Now, in some settings, like oncology or infectious diseases, these are open trials, and so you know what's going on. The particular area we're working in, which is autoimmune diseases, it was a blinded trial. And so we knew that one you know, Tuesday afternoon, the statisticians would come and tell us whether the drug had worked or not. And whether the tens of millions of investment we've made, not whether the team were good or not. And, and I recall I was sitting in our main meeting room and the head of the project came walking down the stairs and I could tell immediately from his body shape where his head was that things weren't good. And indeed, one couldn't separate the placebo from the active drug. Now, we still had a company around that, but this was to the individuals, to me, a devastating outcome. But every single person from that organization then went on and has had really, really great careers. And how we overcame it, and, and I come all the way full circle and said, this is disappointing. It's disappointing for the investors, really disappointing for the patients where we're trying to make a difference and, and disappointing for us. But let's use it as a point of learning. What have we learned about the things we did to get to this point, the things that we're experiencing now, and how would we do things differently if we were able to in the future? And I think two things came out of that. One is We all, I thought, were stronger for it, actually, as individuals. But the other part was it taught us that what we should be doing is assaying ideas, testing ideas. And if we can do that, and that's what we do for a living, we have to live with the possibility, and actually it's the majority possibility, that things won't work. If it was easy, it would all have been done already and we wouldn't have disease. It actually is incredibly difficult to treat human diseases. Is it easier to test more quickly and less expensive to test more quickly these days so you can quickly eliminate ideas that won't pan out? There is a concept of so-called failing early. And I think certainly some of the insights we have these days with respect to genetic and protein and outcomes information, and of course, a lot of the testing apparatus, scans and so on, is improved many fold. just means that you can take decisions earlier and make the tough decision, which is let's not do this anymore. I think one of the great strengths of the capital discipline in biotech is that it's a tough thing to do, but the right thing to do is to say, actually, this hasn't worked. Let's stop the program. Investors will be disappointed and there'll be noise and you know they'll want to fire the CEO and all that sort of fun stuff, but actually, it's the right thing to do. It often has been the case in the past that in Big Pharma, the next hypothesis would then be presented and then another experiment could be done. But most of those drugs, it's unusual for those drugs then eventually to survive and become something that makes a difference to patients. And that discipline of capital um, is really, really important. 
Okay, last question is, you know, is there someone along the way that you worked with or even read about and has had an, a very profound impact on the way you lead or the way you interact with people? Is, is there someone through partnerships or et cetera? I'd like to pull out two people, if I might, one of whom unfortunately uh, died many, many years ago. And he was a professor of medicine at Liverpool University where I trained and we spent a summer together. And he was an extraordinary guy who discovered during the 1950s uh, many, many disease pathways and so on, a guy called Rod Gregory. I once asked Rod, and I was a child, you know, early 20s, what is the most important discovery? What's the most important thing from your career? What have you laid out? And he said, oh, it's very easy. He said, it's the people I've worked with and trained and the legacy of those people. And I've never forgotten that conversation. When you're 21, you've got no idea what that really means. But as you get older, to my age, you understand how, actually how important that is. And that legacy is really, really important. And the proudest moments I have actually is walking around the streets in JP Morgan, where people who I haven't worked with for many years will stop and just say hello. I'm elated by that because it means that as a minimum, they've rem remembered me, but also maybe fondly and maybe have learned something from our interaction. So that's one. The other was my boss at Pfizer, a guy called Joe Feshko, who was the chief medical officer, lived and worked in New York at the time. And I remember him just having a kind of a word with me. I think really what he was trying to say was kind of calm down and take your time and study what's going on and understand what's going on, because the things you gather at this phase in your career will stand you in great stead. And they were really, really wise words. And over the years, uh, not recently, I have to say because of COVID, but over the years, I've touched base occasionally with Joe and sometimes just sort this counsel again. So what do you think about this? Well, Elliot, thank you so much for taking the time and it was a pleasure uh, speaking with you. I know our audience will find this very insightful. Thank you for your time. It's been an enjoyable uh, conversation. 